Okay, we're gonna start with a little super brief, like five minute thing here, and then we'll take a, uh, a bathroom break and everything, and we'll come back and then we'll get into more, more real stuff. Um, so give you guys a stretch. But um, just wanted to start off here, and Zach can, can chime in here with anything that, that he wants to uh, do. So just wanted to give us real quick a, a very brief intro to set the stage. So there's all kinds of terminology. Ta terminology. Our public opinion poll um, historically was, was very interested in this, because back in the day, we had a, a hard time figuring out how to, to uh, what term to use with the general public to talk about these devices. Um, it's pretty much been solved. Pretty much everybody calls everything a drone now. Um, but a but, um, couple uh, uh, terms you guys should know. One is uh, UAV. Um, now, originally, on all the legislation, all the original policies, it'll say unmanned aerial vehicle. Um, mostly, we've tried to switch to a more gender neutral term these days. So now we usually, will, people will say either unpiloted or uncrewed for the U part. It just basically means there's, there's not a person you know, on the vessel making it move, right, basically. So um, uh, uh, un, uncrewed aerial vehicle um, is, uh, we'll talk about the 55 pound things, but, but the 55 pound thing is a FAA uh, uh, definition, right? So this is for relatively small things. So sometimes um, you'll also hear that the things that we use referred to as small or S UAVs. Um, and again, that just means uh, relatively small, can fit, fit, on a, fit in our trunk of our car and you know, relatively easy to put in a case, you know, that kind of stuff. Easy to lift, easy to, to pick up, one person can pick it up kind of thing. Um, and most of them are substantially, substantially less than 55 pounds, right? Um, uh, more generally, we just, we've just uh, all coalesced, coalesced around this term drones. So drones is now, you know, so, so when you read the FAA regulations or something, they'll use some of this UAV terminology, or they might say UAS, um, unpiloted aerial systems. The systems refer, so the V refers to the, the thing flying in the air, the vehicle itself. The system would be all the stuff, the control architecture, maybe some of the cameras and you know, all that kind of jazz, safety equipment and all that kind of jazz. So UAV, UAS um, uh, are, are pretty much interchangeable terms uh, for sort of more technical oriented folks. And for the, for the general public and, and, and politicians and grandma and all those kind of folks, drones are what people um, use. Uh, realize though that, that um, and drones is a more general term. So while UAV usually refers to these small things, hobbyist, small commercial, prosumer, that kind of stuff that we typically use, um, uh, the, the, the drones also, uh, especially with things like the Ukrainian war and all this stuff, often, um, some groups, when they hear drones, they're thinking of these big, large, literally airplane-sized um, uh, devices that are, can stay aloft and you know, fly around the world and things of that nature. Oftentimes not powered by electricity, powered by um, gasoline or jet fuel or things like that. Okay. Um, there's two broad classifications in terms of what the FAA, there's more than this, but, but for the vast majority of the public, um, there's these two broad categories. There's also categories for people that, that are developing technology and inventing things and, and that kind of stuff. But, but that's not really us, uh, at least not us anymore. We used to do some of this stuff. But, um, so this is uh, basically now hobbyists, anybody that bought a drone off of uh, you know, Amazon or Best Buy or whatever, and then there's uh, commercial, uh, commercial pilots or certified drone operators. Um, the FAA, FAA wants everybody to get a test. They just want you to take a test, 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 take a test. So, so the main thing that we're working on, which is this, uh, or excuse me, working towards, which is our FAA Part 107 certification under the Code of Federal Regulations, um, that's uh, the thing for you know, official people that are gonna be making money, doing as, as part of their official job activity, you know, engaging with this equipment, that kind of stuff. That's a certified pilot or, or commercial drone license. The hobbyist one, we'll also do this, the hobbyist one in a couple weeks. It's just, it, it, it's, a, it's a like safety briefing essentially, right? And so it's called the trust test. And the idea there is 
you know, in spirit, it's a great idea in spirit, which is, hey, we want everybody to be safe. So even if people aren't doing this for money, we still want them to know how to behave. Basically, nobody really does the trust certificate, right? Most, most hobbyists don't, don't know about it, don't engage with it. But, but, but that, in, in the legal world of the um, Federal Aviation Administration, these are the two broad, uh, most, most common um, things they want the general public to be engaging with. Um, we have, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the main thing that, uh, that is how you all will engage with um, the regulatory folks is through getting that commercial drone license. The FAA is the entity um, for basically 100 years, is the entity that has, um, or almost 100 years, has regulated the national air space over the US, which is considered the best managed airspace in the world, right? It's also one of the most, if not the most complicated airspaces in the world. So it's a huge, tough job. I would not wish to do this, um, but it's definitely something that's evolved over the years and has a lot of legacy stuff. A lot of stuff that started when there were biplanes and then there were things with propellers and then some things came with jets came along and then there was commercial to, and it sort of you know, constantly kind of evolved. Um, very macho, very male, very military driven, very top down hierarchical, like, like a fire department, like that kind of approach to stuff. Um, a lot of guys with short cropped hair, you know, in charge and that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, a, a specific culture has come along with, with that. It's interesting because the FAA, as with, this is not a management class, we're not gonna talk about management, but um, it's interesting, as with many of our federal agencies, they are twin, they're, they're not necessarily happily conjoined twins, right? There's two parts to them. There's the safety part and there's the promotion part, right? So the FAA is both promoting use of airspace, but also they're supposed to be the bad guy and go in there and, and, and lock it down when something bad goes. And what we've seen in the last few decades is that's a really probably unfair task to have one agency be both the the, the rah-rah cheerleader and the one that has to bring the hammer down, right? Uh, Boeing, for example, is both, but the most recent example of how our lack of really strong um, safety culture and lack of enforcing a strong safety culture um, has led to things like doors blowing off and, uh, and maybe spaceships going to space that can't come back to Earth kind of thing. Um, yeah, anyway, so, okay, so, so, so we're gonna be working towards uh, uh, part 107. And right here, I've already swapped in UAS for UAV. So again, UAV, UAS, uh, SUAV, those are pretty much interchangeable terms um, as you see them in, the, in our textbook or in some of the articles we might read this uh, semester. Um, and to pass it, um, it's 60 questions. It's multiple choice. Um, and uh, it, it, you have two hours to do it. And the only thing you have to do is get 70% or more. So you have to miss um, uh, less than 19 questions, right? And that's it. It doesn't matter. So if you, if you got um, 50 questions right, if you got 60 questions right, it doesn't matter. It's just did you pass or not pass. That's the, that's the, the standard. So that there's no, no additional permissioning you get if you get 100% right. I'd love everybody to get 100% right, but, but it's just a, a minimum. You pass the minimum standard, essentially. Um, OK. Um, now, if you, so all of our drones are registered. If you have your own drone, um, uh, what's a relatively new rule is you have to have that registered. So back in the day, um, we'll talk about this uh, later, but back in the day when we started this, uh, d down this thing, anybody could buy stuff. Just right now, anybody can buy that. So Amazon will sell it to you, Best Buy will sell it to you. Um, you are supposed to then on your own go register it unless it's very, very restrictive, unless you're flying it in very special places and, and very limited things. But essentially, you need to register. So the FAA now considers this thing, considers this thing right here, this classic quadcopter, an aircraft. So from the FAA's perspective, that's analogous to a 747, a 767, one of the planes out here at the airport. Um, and so they want every single thing registered, right? So that means it should have a unique identifier number. So you go online and you, you, you pay a little bit of money and you re it's also one, one time, you don't, you don't renew it, you just register one time. But you, you put your contact info there 
and then you know you have somewhere on the vehicle that what what the number is and so the idea there is oh if i crash it or something or we're trying to you know we know who crashed it or something right we can figure it out that's the first part so the first part was the registration <clears throat> i don't think yeah i don't have it. so another one that uh, has just started as of last year is <clears throat> is remote ID. And so now, what's theoretically supposed to happen, but it doesn't really work, I'll just say that, but, but <clears throat> eventually it will work. But all of our drones have to have essentially a transponder that says, this is who I am, I'm Dr. A's drone, I'm Dr. A's drone, I'm Dr. A's drone, I'm Dr. A's drone. So that if we're getting, if, if say we um, erroneously approach a helicopter or erroneously get too close to an airport or something like that, um, uh, the folks managing the airspace can say, hey, who is that, right? Uh, right now, or at least right up to just about now, they didn't know what that was, right? Because these are small, so these things aren't necessarily picked up by a radar until maybe they're very, very close or not seen until they're very, very close. And so the idea here is let's just constantly be saying, this is me, 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 and then, and then everybody would know where everybody is, right? So eventually we'll get there. We're just starting that. So, so the... Um, the remote ID was supposedly supposed to start last fall, and we we're freaking out because all of our older drones did not have this technology because it didn't exist. And so we had to buy some of these things to essentially uh, jury rig our old drones, and they were massively backward, so nobody had them. And so few people could get them, the FAA postponed the enforcement until this, past sp to this current spring, to a few months ago. And it seems like they still haven't quite enforced it yet. Because uh, I was talking to my son that, that, that flies drones for, for his university and, and stuff, and I just realized he has, we were flying one of his old, old drones, and oh, did you get your, your remote ID here? He's like, the what? <laughs> like, do you have your you know, transponder thing on here? He goes, uh, what do you mean? And I was like, what? What do you mean, what I mean? I mean, like, the, the remote ID. I don't have that. I'm like, what? And he's like, like, so you're not flying this at, on with his like, state partners and all these people and all these sensitive places over all these big projects, like, oh no, I fly it every day. And I'm like, well, how does it, how does it, how, how, how do it, he's like, huh? Eh, I just do it. I'm like, I don't believe you. So then the summer is home and I was like, fly it. And then he flew it and I'm like, oh shoot, I guess you can fly it. Um, so, so that's a work in progress. So the remote ID is a work in progress. So uh, if you buy a drone now, it'll have this stuff integrated. So the good news is you don't have to do any kind of back tweaking and, and jury rigging from here on out. But if you, if you did buy something off of like, eBay or something like that from a couple years ago, it may well not have this thing. And it sounds like for now it can work, but who knows? Six months, a year from now, maybe you might try to go to use it and it might, might, um, you might encounter some problems. So, so the standard is to have everything registered. The standard is to have everything, every unit have its own unique remote um, identifier on it. Um, and that's our best practice and that's what we do. Um, okay, so then just to finish up here before we take a, a quick break, um, we have various kinds of drones, um, most of which we have here in the lab. The vast, 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 vast majority of the kind of stuff that we use and most relatively light-sized vehicles use are quadcopters. So that means quad four, so four propellers. Um, the next most common one, like that guy up on the shelf right there, is a hexcopter. And so that's got six. That's, I think, the most common um, for heavy lift. So if we're um, carrying some of our sniffers to smell um, uh, chemicals, or the classic would be something like uh, a camera, like somebody's filming a commercial, so they have a heavy sort of Hollywood camera that, 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 that um, is bigger than just a, a small standard like GoPro kind of thing, they'll oftentimes use something like a hex uh, copter. That's the vast majority. There are other things. You sometimes get some of these octocopters for really, really, really heavy lifting things. Uh, and then we have fixed wings. So where's, where's, our, where's our fixed? Well, so, so, so that's a fixed wing up there, that one that we, uh, so that one we built right above uh, the table there. Um, uh, so we, and we have other fixed wings. Now our main fixed wing that we use is called an EB, which we'll, we'll show you guys. Um, and then the last broad category is a VTOL. So a VTOL is a hybrid uh, of a, a, a starting like a helicopter, then eventually flying like an airplane. 
So the quad, so all these, where it says copter, these guys are really, really stable. They're fantastic. The technology is absolutely amazing. So even with you not touching the controls, it'll, it'll self-stabilize. And if the wind blows, it'll, it'll, depending on how you have it configured, it'll just, you know, just hang, hang in, in the same spot. Really, really cool technology. So those are really good for getting, you know, um, uh, let, let, me, let me take a picture of Max, or let me take a picture of the, the wall, or let me get the, this, you know, a really good, nice, stable platform. That's great. Um, they do suck a lot of battery, though, for the amount of minutes it's, they're in the air. So m a much more efficient design is an airplane where we're just moving. And so, so the fixed wings are really good to, to be able to get larger areas, let's say, mapped. So with that same amount of battery energy, we can go uh, farther more efficiently. Um, but a fixed wing, you need, a, you need a, a flat place to take off or land, right? So the VTOLs, or the vertical takeoff and landing things, um, are pretty cool. And so they start like a helicopter. So maybe you have just a little small break in the canopy. So you're in a big forest. So you don't have a place you could land a, a, a plane, right? And so they'll, they'll start up and they'll go straight up. And then after a little bit, they'll flop on their side and they'll turn into an airplane. And so they have wings like an, they have wings like an airplane, but they also have some propellers uh, that are like quad, uh, quad blades um, kind of things. So those are the main types of drones that, um, that, that um, play into the kind of stuff that we're interested in. Um, safety, st safety monitoring, research data collection, that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, and um, while we have all these, we're mostly, well, you know, 99% of what we'll be using in this class, which is 99% what we use most of our, of our research, are the quadcopters. Cool? All right, is that all I have here? I think that might be all I have here. Oh, okay, the last one here is um, just uh, the, the manufacturer of drones. So um, uh, DJI is, is the, the massive beast because the FAA has made the decision that these platforms are aircraft. DJI is now legally, they can say this, they are the largest aircraft manufacturer in the world. So something like 80, 90% of all of the drones in the US uh, are DJI drones, right? Um, more about that when we get into the history of our program, but, but that's the, the big player. Um, uh, other players, uh, Autels, we just got three new Autels this summer, so we have some new Autels. Um, Skydio is another uh, California-based company. Um, Parrot is a company that, that um, uh, sort of went through some different interactions, but, it, but is uh, from France, a good solid company. And there's lots of others, lots of other smaller manufacturers or more specialized manufacturers. Um, the main issue here is that <coughs> DJ, <coughs> ah, never mind, oh, well, I'll, I'll talk about it when we get to there. I'm losing my voice right now. But, um, but uh, DJI is probably what you're gonna buy. DJI is the Apple of the drone world, very turnkey, wonderful design, really, really good user interfaces, very slick, very easy to know nothing and come on board and just sort of turn the key and get going. It's really, they're really great. Um, the downside is that they're a Chinese company uh, based in Hong Kong and um, with the, the incredible um, uh, improvements in all this technology, they, they na not now, it's been like five, six years, they've been able to follow you, right? So if you, t if you hold it, take a picture of your face, it'll follow you through, the fo through a forest, right? It'll go around trees, um, do all this crazy, cool, awesome technology. I love it, it's really, really great. Two, two downsides, one, it's the Apple of, these, of this world. I love Apple products, but they lock down the ecosystem. It's very hard to get in and do stuff. So if you're Joe Blow, gonna do, use it for real estate photography, great. But if you're a group like us that sometimes need to add a thermal camera, sometimes need to add a chemical sniffer, sometimes need to go into this place or that place, where we might need to tweak some of the stuff, it's, it's basically impossible to tweak. It's like you get what they give you and then you, you like it, right? So, so that's a downside for those of us doing research and maybe our needs evolve and our needs need to adapt to a particular setting. And the other side is a security risk. So um, because uh, it's been shown, <laughs> DJI does this, they claim they don't, but they actually do do this, just like TikTok, um, the data goes back through these servers in Hong Kong and they don't tell you it does. So they claim you just tick a box and it doesn't do it, but 
it's been shown that um, it does do it. So, so the issue there is, um, uh, uh, you know, for me, I don't care. For you, you might not care. Um, but uh, Department of Defense, State Department, these organizations, are like, hey, we don't want to use this device on our military. So back in the day, we used to take them all the all the time out to Magoo and, and do stuff out there. Now they're like, no. And then <clears throat> in the wake of that, now it's like, oh well, hey, if that if the if it's dangerous for the military, maybe the police and fire shouldn't be using that. And maybe but, so anyway. So long story short, where we are now is we have a federal policy that says you cannot use any DJI products on any federal facility, right, or any federal properties kind of stuff, right? So not military bases, things of that nature. And so um, that's meant for people like us that oftentimes do do work in those places, we have to have an alternative, right? Even if we like DJI and, and we're, not wor we're not personally worried about the security risk or the safety risk, or whatever, the, our partners or our funders or the people that give money to the university, even if I don't have a, a Department of Defense grant right now, they're like, hey, we're not gonna give your organization any money if you use these devices. And so it's, it's forcing a lot of us academics away from the DJI, DJI world. Um, I'll just finish by saying, for all this talk, we are, and we, ESRM remains, we are always technology agnostic. So my goal is to get you all to be safe this semester, right? And of course, DJ, you need to learn DJI. It's mostly what we have in our fleet. It's mostly when you go to the consulting firm, it's probably mostly what they're gonna have, but you need to be technology agnostic. If they have a DJI, cool, let's use that. If they have an Autel, cool, you, let's use that. Might take you a minute or, minute or two to figure out like the, the layout might be a little bit different on the control structure, but all the basic stuff you should totally know. So we, we do not push any one product. We don't, we don't, we're not wedded to any one technology. Again, more about that when we, when we get into our history, but, but um, but that's the, the real quick and dirty basics about intros to drones. So with that, I think that's all I have here.